Inside the stories that affect you, this is Inside Kelloland. Well, thanks for joining us uh, for Inside Kelloland. I'm Tom Hansen. The 2022 legislative session is nearly complete with lawmakers returning to the Capitol on Monday for the, the last day known as Veto Day. Now this half hour, we are taking a look back on the session. We're uh, going to cover a variety of topics from the state budget to uh, federal coronavirus aid and more controversial issues addressed this year, including uh, marijuana legislation, the impeachment hearing for Attorney General Jason Roundsburg. Today, we have a panel of lawmakers uh, joining us to break down some of the big topics in Pierre. And uh, joining us in the studio, we have Senator Jim Boland from Canton and Representative Aaron Healy from Sioux Falls. And joining us via Zoom is Representative Linda Duba of Sioux Falls. Thank you all for being here and uh, for Inside Kelloland. Um, let's take a couple of minutes to talk about the last couple of months and in Pierre and some of your key takeaways from this session. Let's start in the studio with, with Aaron. Yeah, this was a really interesting year for us. We had about three, let's see, it was $3.6 billion from, of federal spending, and we've never seen money like that before. This was really a historical year in terms of how we could uh, utilize that money and put it into our state and um, build our infrastructure um, and, and how uh, we handle a uh, post-COVID world. Yeah, let's, let's go to Linda. Um, how was this session for you, Linda? busy. I spent, you know, six, seven hours a day in appropriations. So Representative Healy already referenced the amount of money that we had from the federal government, but it wasn't just the federal government. We also had a record year for revenues in terms of our sales tax growth. So there were a lot of folks coming to us for one-time projects. So it was a busy time in appropriations. And Jim, over to you. Yeah, I would. Uh, I would say I would agree with Aaron. A lot of a lot of money to uh, be spent. There also was, uh, you know, natural uh, controversy, uh, rivalry between the House and the Senate as to how dif how different uh, aspects of spending would be taken care of. Uh, a lot of um, of uh, perhaps a little bit of unnecessary jockeying between personalities at various times. But uh, but overall, I think the session went uh, concluded. Uh, in a perhaps a positive manner, uh, and we'll just have to wait and see how uh, how it all works out on veto day. All right. Uh, one of the big topics every year is, of course, the budget, and uh, we'll land on some key budget issues. Uh, who wants to tackle that one first? I'll, I'll go first on that. All right. One. Uh, well, first of all, right off the bat, uh, there was uh, we're, we're going to be able to provide a six percent increase to our state employees, uh, school districts across the state of South Dakota, and also our our Medicaid providers, all of those people are going to get 6%. Now, we're experiencing uh, some pretty strong inflation uh, at the present time, but this is going to be able to, uh, to really help uh, those vital aspects of state government at the present time. Then in addition to that, the state uh, received from the federal government a tremendous amount of money, which we are using for one-time spending. One of the things that... Uh, I was convinced needed to be done, and a lot of other uh, representatives and senators as well, is that we're not, we weren't going to start a lot of new spending programs which could not be sustained over a long period of time. Aaron? Yeah, a few of the things that I was excited to see um, in funding, we had over $100 million for our universities and our technical colleges. We also, um, one, one of that, I think it was $8 million was going into expanding a nursing program at Black Hills uh, State University. We don't have a nursing program on the west side of the river, and it's wonderful to be able to see um, that um, that service be provided there or that um, program be developed there, um, especially with the, nur the nursing shortage that we're seeing. Uh, there was $200 million uh, put into um, work house and, or excuse me, um, housing authority. Uh, we have a lot of housing needs in this state with workforce development and with um, the cost of housing rising. So that was a really good win that we saw mm -hmm. in our state legislature this year. And let's see, $6 million for the women's prison in Pierce so we could create a better health care facility. Those women need um, counseling and health care just as much as anyone else. So that was a really good um, serve or uh, funding that we could see um, put towards them this year. All right. Linda, let's get your thoughts on the budget. Yeah, well, again, so some of the items have already been covered, but let's let's talk about some key things that we also did. 
All right. Um, how do we help people? Well, we gave an additional, the governor set aside $3.2 million for victims of crime because they've lost their federal funding. We also gave them an additional $5 million and that's gonna help um, victims of abuse, sexual assault. It's gonna pay for uh, court appearances and our CASA program for women and children. So a total of $8.2 million, that is a huge um, need. And, and I can't tell you how much uh, that's gonna mean to those folks. We set aside $5 million for women in prison um, for our alcohol and drug rehabilitation. And that's something that we haven't been investing in and need to invest in. So please understand the importance of that. We're gonna be building a $15 million facility uh, just north of Sioux Falls for biotechnical research. Again, another one-time expense. We're also giving $8 million to LifeScape. Now, for those of you, I know that this is near and dear to Representative Johnson's heart, and he's on the line with me. LifeScape has been in that same building in Sioux Falls since 1948. And so they're going to be able to expand their new facility. They've raised the majority of the money. And then I also want to say we're taking $10.2 million dollars and giving that to our nursing homes. They're in a world of hurt right now. Their expenses are extremely high because they're not able to hire local nursing and lab tech type individuals. So they're having to pay very high rates and their census is low. So $10.2 million to nursing homes. And there are countless other things that I could talk about, dam projects um, from the flooding that we experienced three years ago at this time that we all remember. And now we're gonna fix those dams. Uh, one of them being just south of Sioux Falls at Lake Album, another one Lake Newell out in Rapid City, and then the Richmond Dam replacement. So I have a whole list here, obviously, uh, being very familiar with what we allocated. But at the end of the day, we focused on trying to spend money that affected or helped the most people across our state. All right. Thank you, Linda. Now, uh, technical problems have been solved, so Chris Johnson is going to be able to join us. Chris, we're talking about the, the budget, your overall thoughts on the budget this year. Thank you. It's usually probably a good thing when I can't speak, but uh, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and give it a shot here. Um, I'm not going to repeat a lot of what's already been said. I do agree with uh, what the other representatives have said, but uh, what was said was that I would, in Lifescape, the Lifescape project is near and dear to my heart. Obviously, I would have hoped that we could have funded that at the full amount of $16 million, but I think we came in at a very good compromise. The state has a, a obligation to take care of children with disabilities, and that goes for school uh, services and uh, the rehab and a lot of the intermediate care, and it was very important for us to fund that so they can go into the next century. But beyond that, um, I'm very proud of the fact that, first of all, that we have a budget. What was most important is that we stayed within our lane as a conservative state to fund projects and backfill projects and not start new programs. Some people can argue that giving the, the big three, we call the six percent increase was funding ongoing but you know um, inflation has been horrible and so we had to address that somehow but I, I think we did a very good job at being reasonable funding projects over programs and that's where i'm at now we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back with all four of our lawmakers to talk about several other big topics in here come back today we're talking about the 2022 legislative session what will officially wrap up uh, oh, this coming week as we take a look back, there were uh, nearly 550 filed bills between the Senate and the House, and that's not including resolutions and commemoration. 47 of them dealt with marijuana in some form or less, then half of those were sent on to the governor. What, what are some of the main points that came up on the marijuana debates? Linda, let's start with you. Well, I think the first uh, piece that came up on the marijuana debate was whether or not we wanted to move forward with recreational marijuana. We had a tremendous opportunity um, through the legislature to uh, push that program out with some very good parameters. And I felt like since I served on the subcommittee, I felt like we put together a very valid proposal for that. Um, it was able to pass the Senate very closely, I might add, but we just couldn't get over the hump in the House. Now, we know that recreational marijuana was turned back. Uh, but it's back on the ballot again. And this was our opportunity to do something that the people had requested. 
and do it before we had to put that initiated measure out there. So I think that's one of the big issues. Um, the other piece that we talked a lot about and finally passed some legislation was around home grow. So, um, you know, we're going to allow two flowering plants and two non-flowering back and forth on that. Finally reached a, a consensus there. So those were, I think, two big pieces that came out of it. And the third was really defining who the providers were that could um, support patients of medical marijuana. All right. Chris, let's get your thoughts on marijuana. Yeah. Sure. Well, um, you know, looking back to how the uh, the measures turned out, and of course, we all know how that happened. Medical won by a very large margin. Recreational won by a very small margin. And of course, that was turned away by the Supreme Court. But um, I, I'm of the belief that, uh, and I think many of others were of the belief that we shouldn't get ahead of the uh, we shouldn't get ahead of things and pass legislation in anticipation that that, le that uh, next measure coming is going to pass. We should let the voters speak because actually now for the first time, it's separated into a single issue. Before, if you remember the re recreational bill, uh, the amendment included recreational and medical marijuana. This is now uh, their split and we'll see what the public thinks on the recreational by itself. And then we'll advance towards, well, there's no need to Hurry. We've made a lot of advancements with uh, legislation, putting all the rules and, and uh, regulations in place for medical. One of the things that I think was very important is uh, that we listened to all of the bills. A lot of them wanted to put extra restrictions on, but I, you know, the thing that I learned through the process was a lot of those were already in place through the Department of Health, so it was not necessary for us to add additional restrictions. And there was a lot of discussion about let's treat it like a medicine, and um, you know that's a discussion that's always going to be difficult, especially when it's illegal, continues to be illegal federally. So there's a lot of issues, but I think all in all, I think we took a very balanced approach, and I think we came up with some good legislation, passed the good stuff, and we re rejected a lot of stuff that's either premature or not necessary. All right, let's continue with the marijuana issue here in the studio. Jim? Thank you so much. Um, well, first of all, this last summer, there was a very extensive uh, summer study done by a number of legislators. I was not a part of that summer study on, with marijuana. Um, the public overwhelmingly voted for medical marijuana, and the legislature made a few small changes in that. One, for instance, involved uh, home grow, which that was kind of the phrase that was out there. Uh, the original bill that was passed by the people said that you could, you'd be allowed at least, you had to have at least three plants uh, to be legal if you were going to grow your own. Uh, that meant that if you had one or two, you'd be in violation of the law, which didn't seem to make much sense. So the legislature, uh, through a compromise conference committee, came to uh, an agreement that uh, you could have at least two plants, two, two non-flowering and two flowering plants. And I'm not experienced enough with marijuana to really know the difference. I think the flowering plant is where the THC is developed and those type of things. So um, I think South Dakota is moving towards having a very, very um, extensive and well-regulated medical marijuana program. And we'll just have to wait and see what happens with recreational. Uh, Aaron? Yeah, I would agree with Senator Bullen. We saw a lot of legislation dealing with um, medical cannabis, being on the Health and Human Services Committee. Uh, we saw everything from um, what type of provider can um, prescribe medical marijuana, can um, nurse practitioners or um, physician's assistants, that sort of, um, that sort of provider. Uh, we dealt with a lot of different IDs um, and, and there's two different types of IDs in South Dakota and so we were, had to write that into statute. Um, one of the bills that I was happy to see die actually was Senate Bill 150 which would have um, really taken away the intent of Initiated Measure 26 with uh, marijuana possession and being able to prove um, that you really need that medication. Um, so it was nice to see that that bill failed. Um, I think we needed as a legislature to stay true to the voters of South Dakota. Like Senator Bowen said, it was an overwhelming percentage of, of people who wanted to see um, medical marijuana be legalized. Um, and also, of, of course, Senate Bill 3, decriminalizing marijuana and regulating the use of it. Um, I hope we, we can see uh, in the future a passage of that. Um, it is important to the people of South Dakota.
All right. Thank you very much. Well, let's take a quick break. We'll uh, be back with more right after this. Welcome back to Inside Cal Land as we recap the 2022 legislative session. We are back with uh, four lawmakers. Another big topic that we have to talk about is the impeachment proceedings for Attorney General Jason Roundsburg. You can probably, uh, some of you can't talk specifics, I, I know, but uh, your thoughts on the process. Let's start with you, Aaron. I think this is another good example as to why 2022 is an unprecedented year. We've never handled a situation ever like this in the past. Um, it has to be taken very seriously because there was a loss of a life, and we are talking about um, a man um, who who is our attorney general. Um, I am looking forward to looking at the evidence. I, I think we will be receiving that on um, veto day. I haven't seen any of the evidence. That's been pretty. Um, that's been kept pretty close-lipped and tight um, with the actual committee uh, that I don't serve on. Um, so it'll be good to be able to review that and to determine what needs to be done um, in the future with, with this situation. Mm -hmm. And Jim, when it comes to this situation? Sure. Uh, well, Tom, I'm a member of the South Dakota Senate, and I could potentially be a juror evaluating all this evidence as to whether uh, Mr. Roundsburg would be removed or maintained. And so I'm not going to make any comment on this subject. Very good. All right. Let's, uh, let's head out to Zoom and let's head out to Rapid City. Chris, your thoughts on the impeachment process? Well, um, I think that all parties in this process that, are, that, are, um, that, that stand to uh, have some kind of consequence by the end of, by the time this process is over, I believe expect a uh, an semblance of objectivity by all of us when it comes time for um, us to vote on this finally. And in order for that to happen, I think the best thing is like, you know, you alluded to in the beginning is for us to not get into the weeds in it. It's obviously a very difficult process and it's uh, it, it spells out a lot of ramifications for either party depending on how we proceed with this or do not proceed and so the, the best thing for us to all to do i believe and especially for my part is to just remain um open keep my ears open and keep my mouth shut on the whole issue because that's what we're expected to do right now just like jurors all right linda your thoughts on the uh, the impeachment process um, well, first and foremost, this is not party driven. So I, I, you know, I think that's what we all need to keep in mind. Um, I have attended the hearings where they were public and listened to the information. I, uh, I will await to see what the committee releases and, you know, then whatever files that we're required to read, I'll read that. And then obviously we will um, do our due diligence on April 12th and come to some sort of conclusion. And that's about all I'm going to say about that. All right. Keller Land's Capital News reporter Bob Mercer has uh, covered the legislative session almost <laughs> four decades now. He described this year as one of the longest and weirdest that he's seen. Do any of you think this session was more unique than past years? Jim? Well, yes, just because of, first of all, all of the money and the resources that were there to spend. We had this potential uh, impeachment situation. We did have some very um, unfortunate, um, how should we say it, personality conflicts and difficulties between uh, the governor and certain legislators. And we have issues between the House and the Senate and all these things working together um, uh, caused it to be a, um, a different kind of a session. But in the end, I think we accomplished our goals and we'll just have to wait and see how veto day went. But I think other than some of these things that, that took place, they eventually worked themselves out at least to some degree. Aaron, your fourth year, unlike any other, right? It was unlike any other. And I think um, kind of what Senator Bowen said, there were just a lot of really strange fights going on. We saw our appropriations committee split up for a while and have separate committee hearings. We saw that similarly this summer with redistricting. Uh, we saw a lot of the governor's initiatives not make it out of um, one chamber. And that's something that we don't quite often see either. And then on top of that, we just saw a lot of really difficult legislation um, in education. Um, I felt like I, I serve on the education committee and I felt like we saw a lot of 
bills that were really harmful for our teachers and um, our educators in the profession um, and telling them um, what they can and cannot say. Um, so it was a, a different year, and, um, and I'm looking forward to potentially a better year next year. So hopefully we'll see that in the, in the future. Linda, let's get your thoughts on the uniqueness of, of this session. Well, I think it was on the last day we were talking about uh, funding for buying land for the, the women's prison, and we'd already heard that prison bill once or twice. Um, and I think when I stood up to talk, I said, now I remember speaking on this on Monday, but was it Monday? And then I said something like, legislative days are like dog years. And there was just a ripple of laughter across the floor. And that's really how it's been. Our days were extremely long. They were, they were intense. Um, obviously, the Appropriations Committee is... It is well known that we split apart for a period of time, which put an undue burden, I thought, on individuals bringing bills to the legislature that were asking for money. And uh, we were able to come to a compromise, but we've got to find a better way to really work through, you know, personality conflicts and issues because those things, we're adults and yes, they happen but we need to be more effective for the people of South Dakota. In the end, everyone is going to tell you we came, you know, we came together, but at what cost? Chris, on to you. How unique was this year? Well, I'm, I think every year is unique. Uh, every year brings its own challenges. Uh, and as far as the weird part, sure, it's weird. But the, the big thing that I, is a takeaway for me is that Consistently in South Dakota, we have a 40 day or less legislative session. This year we ended up with 38 days in total. And I think one thing that we proved is unique, weird, however you want to put it. Uh, when we had the, the number of big issues with the kind of gravity that they carried with it, impeachment, we were still dealing with COVID as far as vaccinations goes, marijuana. Um, uh, and then this unprecedented, uh, it's beyond unprecedented, the amount of money that we had to deal with coming in from the federal government. And now inflation on top of everything. The, the thing that I think everybody should take a look at is the fact that we did our jobs in the same amount of time that we've traditionally done 200 bills in or 300 bills in instead of 550, as you said. I think it's just amazing that South Dakotans have the grit that it takes to come together and do the job and bring midnight oil as we need to and, and give the right amount of attention to all the bills that we give and stay consistent to uh, who we are. We're a tough state and we, we, get, we rise to the occasion, we get the job done. All right, very good. We're gonna take a quick break. We'll be right back. And that's all the time we have for today. Be sure to join us again next week for more of what's going on inside Kelloland.